Hi everybody, this is James Chai, Arf Arf Bark Bark Rescue Foundation, and today I'm doing my vlog number 36, November 13, 2019, and it's going to be about managing resources, I'm just going to turn that down, managing resource guarding, what about uh, in regards to throwing food to our dog? if our dog is reactive. So we're just gonna talk about that. I'm gonna go over a few things. Uh, I'm just kind of following through my theme from earlier, uh, previous vlog in regards to a couple of people, uh, one from YouTube, as well as one from uh, the post uh, who sent me a PM uh, asking about what to do when their dog is resource guarding. One is a Great, Bar Great Pyrenees, and the other one was, uh, I think, part Anatolian Shepherd. And it turns out that the Great Pyrenees, the, the other person was asking, uh, her dog is an eighth Anatolian, so it kind of seems like, oh my gosh, we, we have kind of, uh, those dogs have some sort of similar traits. But, you know, when it comes to resource guarding, dogs tend to do that, uh, period. It's a natural habit for them, for the uh, majority of dogs, um, obviously because food is a highly sought after uh, resource when it comes to canines of all sorts, right? Wolves, so forth like that. When, uh, when there's food involved, wolves will fight if not fight to the death over that, just like a territorial aspect of it. Um, so I want to just go over a few of the things in regards to throwing treats to a dog that is dysfunctional, uh, kind of talk a little bit about before that, and then I'm going to get into some viewer questions, uh, actually some members' questions from my closed group. So hand feeding and resource guarding dog, um, one of the things I'm going to kind of finish off of that end of this as well is to talk about the fact that it doesn't help to necessarily downtrain a highly dysfunctional dog as well. So a lot of people will try to, and, and rightly so, hand feed a dog that is somewhat of a guarded type of uh, resourcing with a, so, sort of a, a guarded aspect when it comes to food. And so they'll start feeding the dog treats, uh, hand feed them from the bowl so the dog understands that they're not going to get hurt. And that works pretty good. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work that well with dogs that are highly dysfunctional or have been uh, tricked by food to get them to come back, right? And this happens in a lot of abuse type of uh, behavior from, from, some, from really bad people. And that's where they want the dog, uh, you know, they want to be friendly to, the, to their dog and something ends up happening. They're not sure whatever it is, but they just lose and they start being abusive and they hit their dog and the dog runs away. Their dog is, of course, scared and they're not going to come back to their owner because you just hit me. So then the human, the owner, will then take a treat or a higher value treat that the dog really likes and give that to their dog again to trick them, entice them to come back. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. A lot of times these people will continue to try to use that same trick over and over again and eventually the dog learns, oh my gosh, every time I come back to you, you give me a treat, but then you beat me later on. So then the dog no longer comes to uh, to the owner when he's called, even with a treat, and then the dog becomes even more reactive and then the abusive cycle happens where the owner goes after the dog because the dog's no longer listening to him even more so because you know, they don't see their own aspect of it. But yeah, so um, one of the things I, I want to talk about uh, in regards to this and the balance of it is when we're giving treats to our dog, it's a bonding exercise. It's training, yes, but it's a bonding exercise. It creates an establishment of trust between us and our dog. This way that we get to understand, okay, you know what, we've got food here, we've got a high value target, and over here that our dog's like, okay, well, what's happening? And for the general population, if you've got a good, happy dog, it doesn't matter. But for a dog that is uh, resource guarding or been through an abusive situation, there's no trust. Because, of course, the dog doesn't know who you are. They're not sure. And even if they pretend or show that they have some trust in you, they may then cognitively think about it and forget or not want to have any more association with you because then they realize, wait a minute, you might just be like every other human being that has uh, hurt me. Um, but one of the things we want to do for sure is by establishing that trust by giving our dog, you know, little snacks and so forth like that because, it, you know, we're providing our dog yummy sustenance. They're really happy to have a little bit of food to eat. They're happy. They start to enjoy it. With a dysfunctional dog, we want to be able to present that yummy treat to them in a very patient manner. So a lot of times I'll take the, the, the treat, the right little snack for them, and there's no trick that I'm asking the dog to do. I never, I never associate, generally speaking, treats with a, a, um, uh, a, a, a down training command where I want the dog to be friendly or not to attack other dogs. I don't do that. So I'm going to turn this off here. Uh, I, I don't do that, 
when I if I go to the point where I want to teach a dog how to do sit stay etc then I will use some treats every once in a while on that not generally usual especially when I have giants because I don't like to have my giants uh, giant dogs sitting because of the ligament uh, and joint stresses that happens over a length of time but um, okay so um, you know the the great thing I think we love about the fact is giving treats to our dog is a is the fact that you know our dog trusts us we get the bond going and we feel incredible joy at seeing our dog having joy because they're eating and they're like just super happy and they're just attentive their eyes are up at us and they're and our dogs are just looking at us with these incredibly saucer eyes that are just like yes yes you're the best in the world for those of us who are looking for our narcissistic little bit of a fix getting a dog is pretty cool um, so, you know, our dogs are really happy and we, we get the opportunity to experience joy with our dogs by giving joy. You know, it's that same thing, kind of like there's a, there's a guy on YouTube called Mr. Beast and he gives away money and just, he gives away $10,000 to a homeless person, which is an amazing thing. Uh, I was just watching a podcast interview uh, someone did of uh, this guy named Mr. Beast. He's a young guy. He's been doing it for a long time. I think he's got like... I can't remember how many tens of millions of followers he has, but um, he said that he gave away $2 million in, I think, in two years' time. And that's from donors and sponsored money in as well. And Sammy's underneath me. Sammy's running around underneath me today. Um, so uh, it's that joy, right? This guy, they're asking him, well, how do you feel? You know, he gave away $20,000. He gave away, a, a, you know, a, a used Lamborghini to somebody. And he says, well, I love it. I love sharing joy. I love watching people's faces getting something they don't expect. This is what our dog does when we give him a treat. Especially it's out of the blue where there's no cause, there's no motivation, there's no you perform something and I'll reward you. None of that. It's the fact that, hey, you know what? Oh my gosh, I, I just want to see you happy. And we go and grab a treat and we give it to our dog. And that's that joy we really get to have. So I think that's, that's, that's cool about the treat part of it. But um, when it comes to the dogs that are uh, are afraid to get a treat from us because of the the, uh, the previous history, the dysfunction, the abuse. We always have to be cautious. And a lot of times people will get a dog that they just adopted and they may adopt a dog that they know has some issues, which is incredibly great. It's a great thing to, to, to do so because then you're thinking to yourself, oh, wow, um, I'm taking on a dog that's just not the typical happy, super duper dog. This is a dog that's going to have some challenges and I'm going to have to be patient and I'm going to have to put time out and get to know this dog. So when it comes to getting a dog for the first time that you know or they suspect may have a history or some prior abuse, you want to be patient. Because you don't know if the dog has become resource guarding or maybe he'll just end up botting to you right away and then that's great and you feel, oh, okay, that's cool. I don't have to worry about it. But we also want to make sure that our dog starts to understand that treats and food and that motivation has to not it can't be mutually exclusive it can't be just between our dog and us it has to be able to be a point where our dog has the the ability to take treats from other people uh to see people's hand movements which is where we carry our treats to see our hand movements and uh things not so um um mysterious and i guess what i mean by that is we we want our dogs to understand the dysfunctional dogs, the frightened dogs, the scared dogs, right? The resource guarding dogs. We want them to understand that uh, that what we have, whenever we give to them, is a constant. That they don't have to worry about it, kind of uh, going away, and we're teasing them or we're making them wait too long for stuff like that. I always try to give treats, um, like I say, the snacks to my dogs, just because. But I also want to, at the same time, tacitly or passively watch and train them to build patience as well and so that with a dysfunctional dog is much difficult because they're always kind of already on whereas a happy-go-lucky dog's like yeah okay whatever i'm gonna get it i'm gonna get it. i'm excited the dysfunctional dog is already on uh, on a bit of alert um so we want to do that and oh yeah and some of you may know us that i'm standing in a i'm standing today so i'm gonna try this because um uh I, I feel that my shirt starts ripping, going all over the place. I don't have a full breath, and I, I don't feel uh, that I can do it. But now I'm trying to look down on the screen. Um, okay, so... Uh, all right, so I talked about that some dogs are afraid to receive a treat directly from a human being. They can they can be some afraid. They'll be a cautious part of it. Uh, skittish dogs, dogs from the Asian meat dog trade out there in China, Thailand, Cambodia, Korea... 
all those places as well, um, they end up becoming very scared, even though they get starved and they're not eating anything. They're super starved. And what ends up happening is these skittish dogs will be so frozen that their motivation to eat and take some food is overridden by their fear of their psychological trauma. And a lot of these meat dogs, uh, the skittish dogs have seen horrific graphic violence and heard horrific graphic violence in these meat dog farms. It's absolutely uh, disgustingly uh, cruel. And that psychology is going to be so traumatized on them that they can't get over these things. And that you giving them a treat. And those of you who have a dysfunctional dog, skittish or a reactive aggressive dog, know when your dog gets up to that level, when they're up to that next level, you could throw a million treats. You could throw the favorite treat in the world in front of them. You could throw a squirrel in front of them and they don't care. And they're just going to keep going after, they're going to keep going after the other dog. They're going to, uh, sorry, they're going to go after the other target, whatever they've got fixated on. And that's a dog that's from a, uh, a V level five, six, which would be a bite level five, six in the APDD scale, which would be a bite level five would be causing uh, lacerations on the skin with bites and bite level six being uh, killing another animal or human being. So that'd be a V6. These dogs I'm talking about, we would be between a V5, V6 to maybe a V7, V8 in that scale range. And those are the dogs who are so fixated that they don't care. Then when we talk about the dogs that I work with, the V8, 9, and 10, and 10 being a dog that's got to be at least 150 pounds, attack six to nine people minimum, uh, weigh, oh, well, be at least 150 pounds, got to be at least 35, 36 inches at the withers. And those of you who know me and seen the newspaper articles know I'm telling the truth about this part. Um, those dogs, eight, nine, and 10 scale level are predatorial in their behavior. So they don't, they don't, they, they target and they're incredibly brilliant. I was just saying that to somebody, uh, a few people in a group PM today. Uh, they are incredibly intelligent dogs, these predatorial dogs, because they've had the historical experiences and the ability to survive by luck and intelligence and emotional context that they're now that much smarter when they become downtrained and they're not so reactive because now they're not on their alert to attack and well defend and attack. Now they're relaxed, but then they're observing at that same speed. And when you see a smart dog like that, it's a way above average dog. It's incredible how you can see the cognition that goes on with these guys. Uh, Walter is like that. Walter's a very smart dog. And same with Nero. Uh, uh, another one here, William is. William is William is pretty smart. He's kind of mini smart because he's only 110 pound Dane. So he's a, he's a small one. He's a little mini smart dog. Uh, but he's got that same part of it. When they learn and they come from really difficult situations, like they say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So we uh, we understand that ourselves and dogs themselves have just become uh, quite brilliant. Uh, okay, so um, you know it's interesting too is that most dogs that are starved in, in a typical situation where they don't have a lot of abuse or psychological trauma, uh, most dogs are so happy even if they're starving to death and you can see their bones they emaciated emaciated I'm thinking emancipation. Mass in the anyways, now I've totally screwed up the language today. So, but I'm thinking of the dogs that are so starved, right? That the rib cage are showing, the bones, the spine, everything is showing. And uh, I learned this actually from a, a guy named Richard Bevins, who runs a rescue um, in Bar off of Barbados. He helps get the dogs off of the island, and um, he also transports uh, dogs with crates and so forth like that throughout all, professional all over the world. And uh, uh, no, I'm not married. Um, so what Richard does uh, is, again, he brings in the dogs that are from Barbados and they're really uh, abused and they're starving. And, and I, he actually told me something I didn't know about dogs that are, are the rib cage and their spine are showing from, from starvation is that they are in, in these dogs that are so starved are in, are in uh, intense pain. They are always in intense pain. They can't even be picked up without feeling pain because there's no fat on their bones. There's no skin. There's no there's no insulation between the hard surface and their bones. And the skin is just barely thin. Most times the fur is already falling off because of uh, no food, right? Malnutrition. And to have them picked up, they're actually in pain. And a lot of times, uh, Richard said what they would do is they put them in soft comforter blankets and gingerly carry them out like they're on a stretcher. 
and um, you know it's uh, it's quite cruel and of course that kind of reminds us of uh, World War two and that type of uh, horrific behavior as well right so um, anyhow uh, so these poor dogs as well they're there's just so so starved but they're so happy to eat food and they're so happy to get attention and and they're just hey you saved me but the dysfunctional dog so much different right they have um, they have a reason to protect themselves and they have learned from things like I said earlier about that, you know, the abusive owner that uses his treats to bring the dog back and, and keep re-enticing the dog and re-enticing and, and keep enticing the dog back and forth and back and forth, right? So, um, uh, it's just beyond uh, belief. So, they've learned, right? The dogs have learned. Every time I do that, you beat me, I'm not going to come back. And then the dog starts observing and starts watching body behavior. And that's something that's really uh, quite important as well. And I'll get to that in a little bit. You know. And then there are the dogs who are, um, wow, they're, they're, they're uh, the dogs who, who are like the, the, um, the meat dogs, right? The skittish dogs, where they may not even come for a treat. They may not ever come out. It doesn't matter how much. It, they could be starving for two, three days and they won't come and get a treat because they're so scared. But then they're also the same kind of dogs that if they do have a piece of food, say for example, they got out a piece of food and they're on their bed, you go near it and they'll viciously guard it, right? They'll lash out, they'll nip and so forth like that to, to save, right? Because then they have the bravery, but they have their small perimeter of safety as well. Um, so we always want to kind of keep in, uh, in mind what kind of dog you're adopting. And if it is a dog that has dysfunctions from an abuse situation, just practice patience at all times. And of course, be safe. Don't put yourself in a position where you may get injured. Even if you think you might get hurt, then don't do it. Um, you know, people who know me, right? I've got scars all over, you know, uh, scars all over my arms and all stuff. It hurts like crazy. It doesn't make anyone brave whatsoever. But just be careful because, again, you don't want to be hurt by your dog. Um, so tonight I'm going to discuss one thing. Primarily about resource guarding, I'm just following up from uh, Casey Schubert and uh, Shannon's uh, resource guarding questions from uh, earlier vlog, and uh, hopefully, Casey, you're still uh, you're online or you're awake to be able to see this today. Um, so we're going to talk. I'm going to talk about why it's not a good idea to throw food at a functional dog. And um, before I go on, please, uh, if you if you like what I'm doing, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. The description has the link to my YouTube channel as well as follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at arf, arf, bark, bark. And if you want to donate, I have GoFundMe and Patreon that will help support uh, training and assistance to people with fixed incomes. Okay. So w one of the things that um, you want to be careful when you are getting your dog for the first time Again, with a you know abuse pass. As for those of you who are adopting a dog knowingly or or suspecting that there might be some issues with your new dog, right? They're going to have behavioral issues. Human beings, no human being is perfect. Same thing with dogs, but you know because the dogs are victimized by us, we don't always know what goes on. And I've heard a lot of stories from different uh, people getting from different rescues that oh you know the rescue didn't tell me that this dog was so and so and sometimes the rescue doesn't know sometimes the rescue does know but most times they do try to give you accurate information and if you don't know you know do a google or facebook search for these rescues and look for whatever people have to say and of course take it with a grain of salt i get a million people after me all the time making little comments and trolling me and, and saying negative things about me um okay so uh what is it here One uh, to keep in, keep in mind is that being able to hand feed your dog, uh, as I talked earlier, how food is not you know, and I've talked in other other vlogs, food is not a communication device in the canine species whatsoever, right? Food does not exist. There is absolutely nowhere in any dog, canine, any of the genesis uh, of the canine species, hyenas, hyena day. I found out that, but there's there's nothing anywhere in the entire canine species that food exists as a communication tool uh, much less as a reward fee it so you know, we have to keep in mind you know again wolves will fight to the death to to over food same with dogs right we have a couple of dogs together and they're they're eating and one finishes and the other one finish is still eating but the one that finishes eating goes over to start kind of go over you're going to get a fight sometimes and with a dysfunctional dog almost always 
And so what ends up happening is we have to keep in mind it's a high value target. It's a resource. It keeps the dog alive. It's a thing that dogs are going after all the time. If it comes into my stomach and it tastes good, then I live. So we got to remember that that food is a high value target. So when we're sharing and giving treats to our dog, we're sharing with them something that we consider high value, that your dog understands is high value. And sometimes a dog with a high code depend, a high code dependency will think uh, that they have a right to our food, which we all know when they're just watching you and they're like, okay, give me food. And you're like, I'm eating, please go away, doggy. Um, but they, again, sometimes a little too much overstepping on the bound, but overall food is a high value target. And we have to respect that part. So we have to respect the value of what we're sharing with our dog. It's a difference to our dog if we give them a, a stuffed toy or a, a piece of food and a dog that's food motivated or is, you know, bit of resource garter that sees food as a higher value what's going to end up happening is that they don't care if you have a stuffed animal they care about the food and so it'd be basically this is a one dollar bill well if the one dollar yeah one no two dollar oh well, yeah one dollar bill this is a one dollar bill uh, food would be considered a thousand dollar bill to the dog so we have to understand the value so that means when we're giving treats we're giving snacks to our dog we ourselves have to keep the consideration of not just the fact that our dog is absolutely going to go nuts and happy and bonkers about it and, and salivate, but that it can cause issues with them and or other dogs that are around them and or other people that are around them as well if the dog is guarding food, guarding resources. Uh, one of the things that I always try to do when I work with my guys and these are the predatorial dogs. These are dogs that do a totally different aspect of approach, which I'll, I'll get into some other time. But um, the goal for what I what I do when I work with a dog in regards to resource guarding and what people who themselves have dogs like that that have resource guarding issues is I try to work to the point where I'm able to get close to the dog. My dog has to be able to trust me where I can actually go right up beside him and be near him while he's eating or be able to touch him while he's eating because of course if I'm near him he's thinking I'm gonna go after his food if I'm touching him he thinks I'm getting ready to go after his food because of course you know the touch he's very much more present than the fact that I'm just kinda of lingering around him as he's eating and I've done that with every single dog that I've worked with I've had times where I put food down in the bowl and even before I even touched the the, the couch to, to give to one of the dogs they already actually bit my hand thinking I'm gonna take the food away and that's happened with Walter it's happened with William uh, happened with my dear beloved Nero they all did it they all bit me they all attacked me for bringing them food but it's the dysfunction that happens right and we want to keep in mind that that dysfunction is based on the fact that they're guarding that and that food it makes them happy and it's what they have to struggle and fight for it's a high value target it is not a communication tool in the canine species it's the reason that a dog lives or dies that wolf packs survive or they don't survive because of food. If you see a bunch of wolves starving, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to try to catch something to eat. That's it. They don't care. They don't care. I mean, and then they start going after larger targets that they normally wouldn't go because they're starving. They're desperate. It's a high value target. We're using this as an aspect of treat motivation for obedience and other type of compliance aspects. When it comes to dysfunctions, giving treats to a dog is not going to help. And we have to keep that respect in it. So we have to also, like I said, look at the value of what we're giving them. And that treat, that snack that we're sharing is, is a very big share with our dog. So we're giving, to us, doesn't mean anything. To our dog, it means a lot. Because well, we, we also have to uh, realize that we've taken for granted that our dogs that we see that are warm and fuzzy and happy and their tails wagging and they're just always happy, they roll over on their back, they're just so happy to see us, they're genetically predisposed to killing. They're predators, genetically. The dogs are out there genetically predisposed as predators. They're able to go hunt down, prey, catch, and kill it and eat it. And so are we as human beings. We are also predators. 
uh, there, I, I'm sure there's a lot of people who say, well, I would never do this, but if you put in circumstances, then it may happen. Those of you who are old enough to remember the much uh, renowned, uh, critically acclaimed book, The Lord of the Flies, that's the same type of behavior that will end up happening. We, we do devolve because we get desperate, but we are predators inherently. So the same part that we have to remember for dogs is that they are predators. And the food, the predatorial behavior the warm and fuzzy happiness and love and codependency and all that kind of stuff. But the root is still there. We have to remember that. Just like when we're driving a car. We can just drive a car and we can drive it 100 miles an hour, 110 miles an hour. And we think that everything's totally cool. But we don't realize that the f impact, should we hit something, is extreme. And which is the same thing as we think our dogs are all happy and, and everything is yeehaw. But the reality is... Our dogs have the potential to be quite mortally uh, efficient on targets. And so uh, that's why, you know, giving patience, watching our dogs, making sure that we are properly training them so that they understand trust with us, sharing the food and so forth like that is really important as we go step by step um, through this journey. The other thing to keep in mind too is our dogs are always watching us for our physical behavior. You know, that's how uh, they, they always say, well, you know, my dog just seems to know what I'm going to do or my dog knows when I'm sad or not. my dog knows when uh, somebody is kind of coming towards us, kind of threatening and all that, right? Because our dogs memorize, our dogs analyze, strategize, memorize our behavior patterns, our physical movements. Our dog understands how we normally move how we are this way you know like me i'm sure my dog's like oh my gosh changes changes too much but our dogs that's what they're looking for right they're predators they're looking for differences in the environment right field of vision processing etc but our dogs are looking for differences in our behavior and they start to understand they start to memorize our behavior when we give them treats so now getting towards the part of dogs that we throw treats to A dysfunctional dog, you don't want to throw treats to. Because here's the thing is, your dog is, that dysfunctional dog of yours is following your hand. They've learned that wherever your hand goes, that you'll throw it. And a lot of times, people who have dogs that are nippy, that are food motivated, that will bite our hands when we're giving them a treat. So that's why a lot of people will sometimes, th well, a lot of people will throw treats to their dog. That dysfunctional dog learns that they have to watch movement of your hand, not the treat. They have to look at the movement of your hand to see that when you are, while you're in motion, opening up your fingers to let it go, because your dog sees that, that fast, that's what your dog is looking for. They're not looking for the treat as per se, they're looking for that movement. And when they see that movement, they know the treat's being released, or whatever your hand motion is, but they know when you release it, they see it, they know, and they go for it. And so that's why they watch it. And so a lot of times, people will sometimes pretend to tease their dog that's dysfunctional. Dysfunctional, not a normal, regular, happy-go-lucky dog, but a dysfunctional dog. And they'll try to tease their dog, and they'll pretend they'll hide it and all that stuff. And that just creates mistrust in the sense that the dog doesn't know what's happening. We want to teach our dog through patience, reliability, especially in the beginning, that what we're giving them is always going to be something they can rely on and the same structured type of behavior that we are going to give them by throwing the treat that way. As long as we're doing it in the same manner every single time, our dog learns the presumption of regularity in our behavior and goes, okay, I can trust my human. Um, so let me just see here. Yeah, so you want to, and if you do throw a treat, uh, if you do bring, so one of the things that I do is when I bring a, a toy or a treat uh, or a snack, right, to, to the dogs, I always have it. So, for example, um, hmm, I don't have anything here to, okay. So, for example, if this was a toy, I would bring this to, for example, uh, to Zevia, and I would hold the toy, and I would slowly move it in a point where my dog, just like a blackjack dealer at the casino, you watch those people, I'll keep it so that my dog can't see that there's nothing else there. And I'll do it slowly because I don't want to make it deliberate like as though I'm being fancy schmancy. I'm controlling the environment. And I'm showing my dog, hey, you know what? This is what I have. That's all it is. And then I'm going to hold it. And when I throw it to them, I'm going to throw it in a measured motion. I'm not going to toss it out. I'm not going to snap it out. I'm going to throw it in a measured motion so that my dog learns to trust my 
physical behavior. So that way, whenever I do it again, he understands. And then it allows the fact that once I start making a routine, uh, habitual behavior that my dog can rely on, then I create variance in that behavior. So that way my dog then learns other erratic behaviors are associated with the baseline of my typical behavior. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comment section. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm happy to explain that in the next blog or if I have time in the comments here. So that's basically it. So we want to keep our routine always set at all times. The problem is, though, when you do throw treats, and I've seen people do that. They send me the videos. My dog is nippy and my dog is, you know, and all that stuff. Uh, don't forget, again, since the dog is watching where our fingers are at all times, our, our motion, our natural motion, they're following the pattern, they're going to follow from memory what other human beings have done it, just refrain from throwing it because it's going to make them nippy. And uh, again, you know, you'll see also a lot of times that when you bring treats with you, your dog is jumping and prancing around and trying to, and, and nosing, at, nosing at your treat, nosing at your hand, nosing at your hand, nosing at your hand, sometimes even trying to get a little forceful and just putting the lips around your hand to get the treat, right? And you, uh, it's just not good. You want to make sure that you're always constant and solid in motion. The other thing too, what happens is if you create erratic behavior, your dog is not only going to not trust you, when they meet somebody with a treat, they're not going to be able to interpret that person's behavior either because they're going to start reacting quite quickly to the other person's behavior. And what happens is if somebody's confronted by a reactive, nippy, bitey dog, they start panicking their motion. And then your dog goes, oh, they're going to take the treat away or they don't, or they're going to about to throw the treat. They're going to think you're going to about to throw the treat. Going to think about to go. They think you're about to throw the treat or they, or your panic makes them think you're about to throw the treat or taking it back. So it depends on what the dysfunction of the dog is, desperation, etc. So what ends up happening is your dog will then end up biting the person because they got over anxious and it wasn't your dog's fault. Your dog is following behavior that we didn't set properly for them. Okay, and, and and the other thing too, um, and I'll get into this some other day as well, is when our dogs are tracking what we're doing and throwing stuff to them, playing and all that, just keep in mind that dogs can judge size and velocity, right? I call that velocity targeting, why some dogs get hit by trucks and cars and other dogs don't get hit. Same thing with how come most dogs can catch things and other dogs can't because of velocity targeting. But when it comes to this thing of dogs judging size, uh, you, you, think about this. When you throw a ball to your dog, it doesn't matter what the top, it could be a softball, like a, a like a, well, not a tennis ball because they can choke on it. But if it's a soft chew type ball that is indestructible, I'm just going to say that, or a hard, do, hard ball or a golf ball, which is not good for their teeth, but, you know, a harder ball. You notice that your dog is going to run for that target, especially if we lob it so that we know they're going to catch it. So they're going to run for the target, which is the ball. They got to not only pay attention to the arc of the ball, the speed, the weight, the the you know the vectors, all that blah 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 stuff that I don't have any idea anymore what those mean. <laughs> but your dog's going to go for it, and as your dog goes to grab it, hey Rita, as your dog goes to grab it. At that instant, your dog has to make an adjustment on, on the velocity in case they're wrong, right? So they have to make the adjustment. And as they grab the ball, they have to actually feel the size of it. Because you notice how they only open their mouth just enough to grab it. They don't, like, open their mouth wildly. If you throw them a grape, they're not going to be like, ah, well, unless, you know, unless we're wildly trained. But they'll, and then they'll, they'll grab the ball. And they know in that instant, within a tenth of a second, how hard to bite down on that ball. It's just like us, right? We know how to bite somebody. You know, when I was a kid, I would, me and my youngest sister, who was only a year younger than me, uh, we would fight and bite each other all the time, right? And we'd have huge bruises and we'd try to make each other lose skin. But we knew how hard to bite. So the same thing that our dog is doing that. But he, she, our dog, your dog is reacting and, and catching in a tenth of a second, making all these adjustments and all stuff. So the same thing when we're throwing treats, I'm just saying that your dog is able to process what's going on so fast, but we don't want to make your dog think as though we're being erratic because then if they're having to pay attention even more and more and more to our actions that they can't predict, then your dog's going to think that they either lost out or that you're taking the treat back or you're, anyways, you know, I'm just blabbering now on it because I, I want to get to the um, uh, viewer questions and this is in my re reactive skittish dog support group. And um, if you want to join it, you're you're welcome to. 
and uh, go to arfarfbarkbark.com and under the tab help for your dog help for your dog you'll see uh, some links and so forth to, to where uh, to, to join my Facebook group sorry so looking at this here and you also see screenshots of other people who have read um, uh, I've read the descriptions and looked at photos of their dog and so we go from there so um, uh, from my group here um, there's no photos in this one which is going to be kind of a blind thing for both of us to do uh, it is in me and you my my viewers are going to see it so this is what Tiffany writes I have two Pisangi mixes uh, and I haven't read this before so I, I apologize uh, I have two Pisangi mixes plus two other dogs who are seven years old She's two Pisangis that are seven year old, years old each, plus two other dogs. The Pisangis are the problem dogs, though. They have never bitten anyone or another dog, as they really haven't had the opportunity. I keep close watch on them when we are out and about. So that's good. So, so far, it sounds like Tiffany has a lot of vigilance on her dog. Uh, all four dogs went out there walking, which is great, considering she's got four of them, and the two Pisangis are the problem. Uh, that's really great, Tiffany, that you're paying attention to what's going on. Like, that's, that's awesome. A lot of people don't do that. Our first dog was a very aggressive, reactive dog. He took his issues out on the others, right? And that sounds familiar. If we bring a human analogy to it, we could probably say we know three out of ten people who take their problems out on others. So this is the same thing. The human analogy, the, the human psychosis bridged onto the dog uh, psychosis, but at a rudimentary state of psychological application, okay? Um, okay, so... Uh, he took his issues out on the others. Because of that, I almost never walked the Pisangis with him because I didn't want to pass it into them. So she didn't want the Pisangis to pick it up or having a, either a negative or a really negative uh, influence happen. So so that was great um, to a point. But he took it out on them at home too when someone walked by or a cat, cat ran by or someone went by. He's gone, He's been gone for one and a half years now. Oh, oh well, I'm sorry to hear the, of the passing of your dog. Um, you know, we've all experienced it and it's really hurtful. It's really hurtful. So he's been gone. Uh, you know, the dog, when he starts attacking other dogs in the home, it's a, it's a, it's a dependency issue. So, uh, because he's passed, we won't talk about that. Uh, I have seen some improvement in them since his passing, but not a great deal. However, on our property in the mountains where no one else is around for acres, uh, and acres and acres. I sometimes let them walk off leash. We have worked on the recall a lot over the last year, and they have improved a bit. They can even see uh, they can even see one of our cats and stop chasing them when I say no. That's a drastic improvement. Okay, so that means that so now we're learning now that uh, Tiffany has uh, her two percent two percentages that are prey driven or at least cat driven in that sense of it. So she's now able to call them off. From attacking the other cat, uh, going after the other cat. So these things that we just want to remember, right? These little key points of reading through the description and what we infer. And like I said, you see, I talked about that when she says that one dog was like this kind of behavior, lash out at others, and then she continues to talk about that if he didn't lash out there because you didn't see them, then when they got home he would lash out, right? Human analogy. So so that's that's that part, and then we just suffer it. Okay. So um, Lincoln, stop. Thank you. Right, the same thing again. We have the conversation with our dogs. And I'm going to do that in my podcast. I'm going to start talking about <gasps> Lincoln. Uh, talking about Lincoln. Uh, talking about podcast. Uh, and my podcast topic is probably going to be conversation and why conversation with our dog is so important. So again, you see that he started up again because there's a dog outside. He's irritated at the dog outside and just telling Lincoln to stop conversation. But it's the voice key that I've established with him, the work that's been done. Um, and... So anyhow, okay. So the Basenjis are reactive to sounds, people, and animals. At home, they bark at noises they hear outside, and it takes a couple minutes before they stop, no matter what I try. So I'm going to post in, in this vlog the link to uh, my earlier vlog, Dogs Barking at Noises Outside. And it's also uh, uh, co-titled with uh, when my sibling's uh, dog died. My dog's sibling died. Um, but the one about barking outside... Uh, it's just a really simple technique to deal with Tiffany and you'll see it works I mean right here is proof because uh, and I can't even see Lincoln he's on the other side of the wall hiding from me because he knew he wanted to bark he's such a jerk uh, um, okay so they hear noises they go outside um, someone uh, you know uh, what is it at home they bark at noises they hear outside and it takes a couple minutes before they stop 
no matter what, if anyone knocks on the door, they go out of their minds. If someone comes in, they do eventually settle down if, if the visitor settles down too. But anytime they move their feet, they start up again. Every time my uh, BIL, BIL moved in with us. I don't know what BIL, I would assume boyfriend and boyfriend in love. I don't know. Um, moved in with us for six weeks and it went on the whole six weeks, which means, so that what she's saying is, Despite the fact that, you know, her dogs, her percentages would go nuts and all that stuff till the people came into the home, then they would somewhat settle down as they were able to act, not acclimate to the people, but to be able to supervise and observe the dangerous people. And then the dogs understood that because of the control and the confidence that Tiffany has. Minky, stop it. Minky, thank you. Um, that the control that Tiffany had and the supervision, should I say, not the control, the supervision Tiffany has over all her dogs, then they're able to understand, okay, mom's got it. Mom's going to keep me protected, etc. cetera. Um, and then when people started to move, then it was an, oh, hi, Tova. Uh, oh, oh, brother-in-law. Oh, okay. It's been a while since I've been married, so uh, I, I didn't realize that. That's that's cool. Um Okay, so um, so then whenever people would move, the, the percentages would then get riled up in that aspect of it. And it's a part of a, a unpredictability, right? It looks like that. Well, why are they doing this? It's more of a fact that, that um, your two percentages weren't pleased and there was not an announcement or an adjustment to that. I don't know the names of your dogs. It's always super duper important that people read the description panel to see what to write down in their posts. I do realize you didn't put any photos, but I do need to know the names of your dogs. Uh, the most important part about naming your dog is because you give them individualization, you pronoun them, you give them an emotional context, you become emotionally franchised with your dog, you fall in love with your dog. And so I do understand a lot of times people become somewhat disenfranchised with their dogs because of the behavior and they no longer call them by their name. And I talk about this in other vlogs is when you're going out with somebody, it's like my girlfriend Susan. Oh, Susan's great. Susan, Susan, Susan's this, Susan's that. Yeehaw! And then when you break up, my ex-girlfriend Susan. No, it's my ex. That's it. There's no name. My ex. And we totally emotionally disenfranchise. And that's what happens when we don't talk about it. That's why I always ask for people to uh, provide personalized information. Uh, okay, so... On walks, it's even worse. Any person or dog they see, even if they are way down the street, they tense up and they woof. As we get closer, my dogs have laser focus on the thing they are reacting to, even if it's just a trash bag on the curb. And then what happens is because of their targeting, like I talk about actually by coincidence, velocity targeting, the dogs are just targeting these objects to begin with. The concerns, they're not sure of the garbage bag, what it may bring to them as a threat but they do understand that it's something that they need to investigate because they have a reluctance and a fear of low insecurity because of the two aspects. It sounds like they're interdependent dogs, then the insecurity is feeding off each other, and then they're finding bravery, which means that they're probably barking in unison at the same time, and they probably stop at the same time, except usually once in a while, one of them will bark a couple more barks after they both supposedly stop. And that's somewhat of an interdependent behavior on these two. You can just tell by the way you're, you're talking about what your dog's behavior is. Um, and okay, so even if it's a trash bag, leashes are always tight for those two, but especially tight during a reaction. They lunge forward other, at other dogs or people. I can still keep them from actually getting to the thing, but it is frustrating, annoying, and embarrassing. So I'm going to put another link in there because I'm going to read over this, uh, this video. Uh, I'm going to put another link in it in regards to the psychology of buying the proper leash, which is something that everyone already has pretty well, proper leash, but it's why and how it will help for about 40% of the dogs with leash issues to help address it in seconds, without treats, without medication, just addressing the psychogenetic behavior of the dogs, right? It's like you know somebody so well, you're like, I can finish their sentences. It's the same thing we do with our dogs. You fall in love with your dog, I fall in love with my dogs, other people's dogs to help them heal. Um, okay. Uh, we live next to a dog park and I take my dogs all the time, but the whole time I have to scan to make sure no one is coming because I would have to grab my dogs and go as fast as possible. So you see that that part we talked about, I talked about in the beginning of Tiffany's post in regards to how much of a supervisory role that she has. Okay, so it's going to tie in at the bottom and you'll see where I get to now, okay? Because this, okay, so um, make sure no one's there or leave the place as fast as possible. If someone does start walking toward the dog park or by the dog park, they run to the fence and they bark like crazy and they won't listen to me. 
And that's something that's difficult because if we could run as fast as our dogs, that'd be great. We can't. The only other aspect that I would say in a situation like that, if you want to down train them from that, is getting them a lead line of about 20 foot, even a 30 foot lead line. Go to the dollar store, buy a cheap rope for two or three bucks. That's 20 feet, 30 feet long. So you don't care if it goes through pee and poo on the grass and gets dirty, whatever. Then you can stop them that way. And you don't freak out on them. You just have to be kind and patient. But that's a different topic. Okay, um, let's see, okay, um, Alicia, okay, uh, if someone start, does start walking, okay, they run to the fence, bark like crazy, won't listen to me. I have to run over and get their leashes on and pull them to the exit opposite of where they are coming so I don't have to pass by them. So then what she does, uh, Tiffany does, is she then goes out the other exit because she knows the other people are showing up. So, of course, that's always a difficult situation because then what we're teaching our dog, and I talk about this in another part, it's probably in the leash psychology one uh, to be a leash ninja is the fact that when you walk away with your dog doesn't matter you hire all these trainers and behaviorists and everyone says well if there's a situation cross the street turn turn direction whatever go, go run away that's what it is so you're telling your dog i can't protect you i'm running away you have the dog park you see the other dogs and then you go outside the exit and what happens tiffany is you're telling your dogs we need to run away my dogs, you know, 140, 160, 180 pounds. And when they dig in, it's two to three times their body weight. So some are generating four to 500 plus pounds of digging that I have to hold on to. And I will still walk out the same exit. If there's no altercation, if there's no freaking out from anyone's dogs at my dogs or vice versa, I will walk out the same exit that I came in or else, I mean, sorry, if there's nothing that happened, then I'll just walk out whatever exit there is. But if there's actual situation, because what's happening is your dogs, your Basenjis, already know that those dogs are going to come through that entrance. So you see the psychology of what happens is other entrance, okay, run away, right? You know, anyways, so it's difficult. So what do I suggest to do, Tiffany, is to let the other dogs come in. You have your dogs, your Basenjis on leash, so you just hold on to them and you struggle with it. Um, there's ways to address it. Like I said, I get, I have five dogs here, all leash reactive, all dog reactive, all food reactive. Uh, well, four out of the five because Sammy's okay. She's, she's not a big fan of other dogs sometimes. Um, but they have the food issues. How do I get them integrated? Right? So they all have to be worked. They all have to understand that there's a parenting on my end, not a supervision. And then we'll get to that part as we go through this, uh, three quarter point here. My large dog, 110 pound plot hund, hound, is generally fine with other dogs on his own, but when they start going crazy, he gets very tense as well and, and has some of their behaviors as he is very protective of them. And so, in actual fact, I would say in regards to your 110 pound dog, uh, and unfortunately I don't know their name, so it's going to be hard to create referencing points here. Um, what ends up happening is why he gets very tense and all that stuff is actually he's feeling the abdication of your supervision and parenting of the the whole pack and so what ends up happening is you're basically by you not being able to show that your dogs are being protected by you then he gets into it because he's like well if these two Basenjis, my brothers, my family, if they're reacting and they're reacting and they're reacting and mom's not doing anything about it to protect us and it's getting worse and they're getting even more upset and they keep trying and all that, then I feel anxious too and I don't know how to react. And it sounds like he, your hound is, is a 110 pound dog, is, is a pretty happy friendly dog and he's pretty chill 99.5% uh, of the time and this just creates the anxiety and it's basically him saying, Get it together, woman. Get the get it together, human. And that's essentially what he's saying, right? He's saying you're not protecting us, and you're letting these two go nuts, and it's driving me nuts, right? So, um, this past week, a dog that lives on the other side of the dog park was barking at Hansel. So Hansel, um, okay, Hansel's one of the Basenjis. So now we know Hansel. So you see this part here. So even before I read onward. I, I can uh, you you can you can tell you can, by that use of Hansel's name is this is a more personalized intimate description now, so I don't know if it's going to be a good or bad description, but it's going to be a more personalized intimate description. 
so we can see that detail. Um, now one of the percentages also, and he was barking back. Okay, so uh, a dog that lives on the other side of the dog park was barking at Hansel. One of the percentages also, he was barking back and trying to get to the dog, and the dog reached under the fence and bit his foot, which required stitches. So Hansel got his his foot bitten. It was then that I realized that I really needed to figure this out for safety. So we there's there. So we talk about the personalized description now. Got his foot bit. And then responsibility taken by the human. So this is personal detail, right? We can see the arc. We can see we can see all this stuff, right? It just all makes sense. It's human logic. Then we go to the part here. And oh, so what basically happened is that means Hansel and the other dog, the other Basenji, they're actually more um, more fearful, more afraid of issues happening than not. Than not being, they're, they're afraid that they can't even defend themselves. So that's how high their anxiety aspect is, Tiffany. The, your, your dogs, your percentages have no idea what to do. And there's no direction on your end because they themselves have gotten themselves out of control. And then and then your, your 110 pound dog is just getting in it because he's just like, do something! You know, it's like, it's like being on an airplane with a crying baby. Unfortunately, you have two crying babies, and you're just like, Arr! and then, you know, you, you, your partner's saying, do something. So that's what's happening for your 110-pound dog, but for uh, your percentages, uh, for Hansel and all that stuff, the, 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 the information that you described here and the flow of your information just demonstrates the fact that your percentages aren't actually uh, dangerous dogs, as per se, in the sense that they are just so overtaken by and frozen by the inability to feel protected by you. So we talk, you know, you, you talk to a trainer behavior, say, oh, dog's fear reactive and blah, 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 blah. Okay, dude, if it dogs, if I'm paying you $400 an hour to tell me that my dog is dog reactive after all your academia and your PhD and your, your uh, you know, BA and master's and all stuff, and I'm paying you $400 an hour, what is fear? What's the basis of the dog's fear, right? Anybody reading this is going to say the dog's afraid, the you know, uh, owner's uh, owner's not strong, blah blah, all these kind of little things to, to eat at it. But the key tone, uh, key words are going to be fear, fear reactive, dog reactive. So now I've just explained to you, they're dog reactive. Took me, well, if I read it and we were working on a consult basis, and then it would have. It would have taken me a few minutes to just tell you all this, right? So now you know. That's why they're acting like that. Um, I want them to be happy, carefree draw dogs like I see everyone else having. You know what, <laughs> Tiffany? That's my dream, too, is to have a dog where people can hang out with and play with. Lincoln's like that with one of them. Walter's not. Uh, uh, you know, other dogs aren't like that here. Uh, it's a dream, this fantasy. But, uh, you know, we choose not that we want to but we adapt to what we are given. Hey, I just made that up. So we adapt to what we are given. Because when we adapt to what we're given, then we learn and we grow and we evolve. So here's all the things with all these dogs here in my place. All these dogs, when they come in, I have no control over what they're like. I just know, and I only know how dangerous they are. They've attacked people. They've dragged people into the shelter. They've dragged people over fences. They have bitten people in the face. They've bitten children in the face. All these things, things they come to me. I'm like, I'm just going to deal with it. And I adapt to it. I'm a bit more high-functioning. Uh, my brain works pretty uh, darn quick, unfortunately. It's, just, it's really uh, irritating sometimes, actually, because I have no one who talks at my level about this particular topic, about dogs. And so... Um, it's I, I'm processing what's going on with all these dogs at all the times. So I have to. I have to pay attention to what's going on with the dog. You're sounding like it yourself, actually, to get onto your part, Tiffany, not about James. Uh, it sounds like you, Tiffany, are getting on it yourself, that you are doing the supervision. But here's the problem. So I talk about the supervision three-quarters of the way, halfway down, boom, 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 supervision, supervision, this great, incredible, strict supervision. Now, how do we change all of this? How do we change? Okay, I'll bear finish the rest of it. Uh, I want them to be carefree, happy dogs like I see everyone else ha have having. I know that my past dealings with my aggressive dogs have shaped the way I deal with my current dogs, which isn't conducive to making happy, confident pups. That much is apparent. Please give me some advice and get me started. I need to make a change for them and me both. I would include pictures of the of a of posture or video of what I'm dealing with, but it's impossible to do that while I'm dealing with them. Totally understand. 
Uh, Tiffany, if you get a chance, please post photos just so I can get a better in-depth uh, aspect of it. I don't know other than the um, intuitive inferences that you've given in your description. And it's a beautiful detail. I absolutely love that. And um, I can only give you some really basic information because I really need to see the way the dog looks. Why do I see photos? Why do I ask for photos? Every trainer and behaviorist should ask for dogs' photos and you match it up. For you trainers, behaviors, dog walkers, you read the uh, you, you look at the photos, you read the photos, the body language, everything like that. Put that with the descriptions. That works. It's like going, it's like dating. All right? I'm looking at the photos, but I'm also reading the description. It doesn't matter. You could be the hottest woman in the world. But if if I don't think we're compatible or you don't think I would ever be compatible with you and I feel that I'm gonna like no I'm not gonna right forget it because it's not gonna ever work out we want to have that mutual thing I'm not gonna play the games or pretend I just want to make sure that I have that connection with that person same thing with your dogs you want to connect to your dog and you want the trainer and behaviors to connect to your dog emotionally you want them to be able to go oh, okay now I see what you see in your dog then it causes them and it inspires trainers and behaviors to then want to help your dog on an emotional basis versus the trainers and behaviors and I saw a post I got deleted today about someone who killed their dog and she's a trainer and she consulted other trainers and she used the horrifically disgusting term behavioral euthanasia it's a weak persons inexperienced persons professionals application of the word no such thing as behavioral euthanasia I have a hundred percent success rate across the board the most extremely dangerous giant dogs attacked people just significantly dangerous dogs that have been turned down by every behaviorist and trainer in North America PhD behaviors nobody they all said that the, the, the certain dogs would kill them it works 100% across the board is, is what I'm saying so um, the, this part here how are you going to deal with this, Tiffany? It's to adjust your tone to begin with. And when you adjust your tone, it's going to psychologically affect the way you conduct yourself. So it's a part of, here's the key tone, and just trying to judge by the way you're talking and the writing and all that stuff and everything. You're going to adopt a more and present a more mothering tone of voice. Lincoln, stop. Lincoln. Lincoln stop, Lincoln, stop yelling. Lincoln? Lincoln. 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 Thank you, Lincoln. Lincoln. He's making eye direct eye contact with me right now. Um, okay, so um, change the tone of your voice to a bit more of a mothering tone of voice with a slight bit of firmness. So in between a soft, loving mom to a firm, tough, love mom, kind of in the middle. And, and you're going to say, well, why is that? What does that mean? Dogs hear and understand tone, just like I did with Lincoln just now. You saw how I went up there, and then I and he didn't stop. Then I went back up, and then we followed him down, and I followed down his tone. Then I made an adjustment in the way I flowed my voice and what I said to him and the words I used conversationally. Dogs understand tone. When we were kids, and I and those of you who follow me have heard this uh, before. When we were kids. And our mom called out our name. We knew the way she just said the first syllable of our name. If we were going for ice cream or we're going to get grounded for a, a year. Which I think I was grounded probably like... Actually, I should still be at home. <laughs> um, so, so that's the thing, right? Our dogs hear the tone. They're processing at a tenth of a second. They're hearing absolutely everything. And a lot of you who know your dogs that well, you know when your dog's whining for certain reasons of tone, right? You know if they need to go pee or they want affection. You can hear in them whining. Use that intuition, Tiffany, for your dogs. Use that kind of in-between mothering and firmness of tone. And in, in actual sense, I would... Um, I'd keep a bit of a sharp enunciation in the beginning first half of your command and then towards the end I would soften her out a bit and round out the consonants and the and the vowels at the end of it like that. So I'd be talking like this and then talking it down a little bit more softer like that. And it's going to cause your dog to think because what's going to happen is now we're developing a voice key for your dog. Zah! All three of your dogs because it sounds like your fourth dog, right? You were saying that. So it's going to give a voice key for all of your dogs to start paying attention. And when they are starting to pay attention to you, you want to acknowledge their names. And I talk about dogs and seniority and acknowledging dogs and the seniority of the way they came into the home. Because we know when we start a job somewhere, we know where 
and who was before us, or we find out who was before us, and we know who gets hired below us. We know our own seniority. And we don't have to be union either, right? So with our dogs, they understand it. They may not appear to be that smart to some of us who think dogs are dumb, but our dogs are absolutely brilliant. As I said earlier, they're predators to begin with. So uh, that's what I would say in that regards is use the seniority. I'll put the link in here as well. So that's another three, another note on my end. And uh, just make an adjustment to the tone. Read that. I mean, sorry, watch the psychology of buying the proper leash, barking at dogs outside. Use that tone, the language again, the tone. And then you can use that tone, that language when you're out on leash. And then we can follow it up when you post some photos and let me know what's going on um, with that. Don't expect a miracle overnight because that's absolutely impossible. But what you can expect is that they're going to make more eye contact with you. And then you're going to have one of the three dogs uh, start to kind of act silly around you. And the reason why they're going to act silly is because they don't understand what's going on. But they're going to feel more relaxed because you'll have adjusted your yourself there. Um, and I know Annette, you asked about um, how do you help a dog control the emotions. The more ex ex and anxious the more he continues to work himself into a yapping frenzy uh, we kind of talked about uh, the tone just now with Lincoln and so um, I'll have to get to that another time and I'll probably go through my podcast uh, when I start figuring out my episodics and my uh, my arc and it'll be about conversation uh, with our dog and I'm also going to do one in the podcast I'm probably going to just intertwine the, the the publication of it I'm going to do one about how to prepare yourself for your dog's death also known as how to prepare your dog for their own death. And um, this is going to be a, a hugely impactful, emotionally impactful um, uh, uh, catharsis for me uh, as well. It's something I actually put into play over a year and a bit before um, uh, one of my dogs passed away. And um, so we're going to go on that end. Okay, and then the next one here, uh, Tova. I don't know if you're still there, Tova. I've only got about 15% battery power, and so if it doesn't carry on, then I'm going to do it to the next one here. Okay, uh, Tova says, this is Riley. So Riley's a, uh, a little black, oh, Boston, uh, Boston, right? Um, she just turned two on September 30th. We rescued her at 10 months of age. Uh, I feel like she's getting worse. We have spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars on reactive dog classes for her and one-on-one -on -one training, and I'm at my wit's end. Uh, Tova, if you're still there, who, who, where did you go for uh, training? Um, and what did they tell you? So if you have a chance, put that in the comments. I want the best life for her, and I'm worried that she isn't getting what she needs. We don't know what happened to her during her first 10 months of living. Okay, yeah, so who did you go to for, for the reactive dog classes? Uh, hundreds and hundreds of dollars sounds like a lot. And then one-on-one -on -one training, who was that? And what did they say? Um, I want the best uh, for her life. So I already know, even before going onward, Tova. Uh, Frenchie. Oh, sorry. I'm so bad. I don't know the dog's breeds. I'm so bad. I apologize to everybody. Even Danes. I'm like, hey, is that a Dane? No, anyways. Um, but, uh, uh, so, okay. So you want the best life for her. So I already know right off the bat there, Tova. Uh, good. Oh, okay. Um. Um, so I already know off the bat. So you know, you know, you know, you can get it ready to post it, or whatever. Is the fact that he, she was doing really well. You had no issues as per se. You didn't really notice things, and then some little quirky things happened, and then you're just like trying and trying and trying, and then you're at a frustration point, and then you keep trying again, and she seems to be happy and good again, and she keeps going back and forth, back and forth in her in her growth of it. Um, we don't know what happened to her during her first 10 months of living, but she is extremely reactive to other dogs only while she is on leash or inside my vehicle or inside our home. She plays appropriately with dogs when she is off leash. Okay, so we always, we so we know the fact, right? Everyone talks about his dogs on leash. They, don't, they feel threatened. Uh, a lot of times the leash aspect is not, again, it goes back to the buying, the the psychology of buying the proper leash. You'll see why, because people start sp spaghettiing the leash, creating insecurities in their own conduct, which then translates to their dog. Um, so you don't know what happened to her in the first 10 months. Where did she come from? What rescue? And uh, so she's reactive and on leash inside the vehicle, inside our home. So, you know, with with the leash part inside the home, inside the vehicle, it's really easy to do. You just have to give her correction and bring her to you and all that. It's a bit more detailed. My dogs are like that too. You just bring the correction in and that's something that would have to be talked about at another time. We can't leave the blinds open. 
when we excuse me when we go for walks my 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 head is on a swivel because I know she's going to lose her mind when she uh, she hears or sees another dog. Um, sometimes she even reacts to people walking with a suitcase or a bag on wheels. I've been taught in her reactive dog classes to desensitize her and do positive reinforcement with her. So I talk about positive reinforcement is uh, kind of silly. It's a, uh, it, uh, you know, and they do the treat training aspect of it early in this vlog. Uh, food doesn't exist as a communication tool anywhere in the canine species, but through human uh, arrogance, conjecture of our, anthrop uh, we're anthropomorphizing our conjecture of animal behavior on dogs by giving them treats, right? So that's why you see people like Temple Grandin and Ian Dunbar. They're kind of silly talking about how you motivate animals and so forth like that with food and other parts. It's dumb. Because food only works with 60% of the people. Oh, okay. She was self-surrounded by someone who had severe mental health problems. Okay, so there we go on that end. All right. Um, okay, so that means that other person that you that that had her probably had a lot of anxiety-driven issues and um, kind of measly in that sense of behavior. Um, so uh, it's kind of like you know, not frenetic, but kind of that nervous Nelly thing. I can't really describe it, but um, okay. Uh, let's see. We can't leave the blinds open when we go for walks. My head is on a swivel because I know she's going to lose her mind when she sees or hears another dog. Sometimes she even reacts to people walking with a suitcase or a bag on wheels. I have been taught in her reactive dog classes to desensitize her and do positive reinforcement with her. Okay. Um, yeah. The problem is that there are no, uh, there's no reaching her while she's in the state, in this state. Uh, there's no such thing as high value treats because she doesn't care. I literally have to run the opposite direction until she's so far away. So, you know, uh, so the, the one question is, does she nip you when you try to correct her? If you try to put your hands on, on your dog, uh, will Riley, um, will Riley nip you or nip whoever's hold, handling her? Uh, the other part is, uh, positive reinforcement, right? So I'm talking about the communication that using treat training, uh, for, for dysfunction is like giving a drug addict more drugs. You're just feeding the addiction. You're not helping it. You're just saying, yeah, keep doing it. You're never going to process. And that the drug addict is never going to process past their point in life because that's they're stuck in that fix. Same thing with a dog. When we give treats to a dog to address their dysfunction, we retard their cognitive and emotional maturity. Just like the drug addict, like the alcoholic, they stay stuck in that stage of their life because they can't deal with those other experiences they can't learn how to get past those points because they're stuck and the only way they're able to go through it is to get food and then what happens is when they get past that point for the dog that's treat trained or treat motivated they pass that point where it's too much all bets are off they just lose it because they're you're essentially saying to your dog i i don't know what to do uh, i don't know why you're angry and i'm trying and you just but we're not on the same wavelength which is that tone, the voice key that happens with the dog. There's a certain rhythm that the dog has. And I talk about rhythm and tone. And people go, oh, you know, dogs don't have that, blah, blah, blah. And, but they do. And they're individual. We've seen dogs react in different behaviors, right? On top of that, human beings, we have our own rhythm. Some people like rock music. Some people like uh, EDM, dance, classical. We all all different. Dogs are like that because they are the sentient beings, right, on a functional behavior. So they... The, so whatever her behavior is, um, so when she's off, right off the, right off the scale and not listening and all that because you don't know how to address her issues. You don't know how to help her feel safe. You don't, Riley has no idea that you know what's wrong. Hence why she's getting worse since it's impossible to even ever create a positive experience for her. Now I believe she is fearful of the dogs and she knows if she barks and loses her mind, the dog will go away. I need help so I can help her. I'm worried she's going to bite another dog or a human if they scare her. So, okay, so the question is whether or not she's bitten anybody, human or dog. Okay, so that's always something you don't have to put that publicly. Um, the other part here, uh, she moves and pulls away. If I try to pick her up, she tries to jump off of me. She hasn't tried to nip me, but she is very vocal. She barks and claws at the ground to try to get away from me and go and see the uh, the dog she's barking at. Yeah, yeah. So she's got a mission, right? She she's got a mission, and and let me just see her. All right, we're just looking at her face, 
right? Because so there's a there's a photo for those of you in my reactive dog group. You see the photo that um, Tova has uh, posted for Riley, and uh, she's basically sitting on a on a boulder, I would assume, looking to her right, which is uh, uh, screen left. And, and she's just watching there and her mouth is closed and you see her paws in a certain position how it's somewhat splayed as well and um, and she is sitting on her haunches somewhat also a bit splayed so she's leaning more to her left side as well you see that so then we look at that behavior with a little bit of reluctance on her end so that becomes an insecurity and it becomes a low self-esteem issue Tova that's it it's that easy to address. We look at and read what's been written down, read what you've said, the description, look at her face, look at her eyes, look at her body position, all that stuff. So she's got low self-esteem. Um, that insecurity is not necessarily insecurity. I guess it's more of an unsecurity, UN, unsecurity in the entire environment. And there's been too much negotiation that's gone on with her. Too much negotiation means you have no idea what you're talking about, means she has no trust in you to understand that she's not feeling valued right so the low self-esteem not feeling valued um, yeah her, her going after other dogs and I mean she doesn't go after does she go after other people and all that um, let me just see it yeah, there's a dog. so okay so I mean it sounds like that she's bitten uh, been somebody has she been in family? Oh, I guess we, I guess can't really talk about that here. Um, can't really move on. And she's, my head is on a swivel when I know she's going to do that. So, so uh, it's interesting detail. I just need a bit more of the precursor information, like the, the pre-detail, uh, you know, what led up to it, what happened while you're walking, and then Riley got really upset, and what happened there, right? The, the details, the what I call the accident reconstruction, uh, recreation because then if we know what's happening in those little details then we know what's going on and because the dogs are reacting at one tenth of a second even the little tiny things that you think are insignificant uh, means absolutely so much right so sometimes uh, Toba writes sometimes depends what they're wearing so it depends on what the people are doing that <laughs> right so then so it comes out again low self-esteem the unsecurity she doesn't know what's going on she doesn't think you understand her feelings of feeling threatened that's it. it, it it's uh, it's giving treats and a whole part of it, right? You know, it's like you, uh, if your partner says to you, I'm going to take you out on a whirlwind trip and then, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to fly to France. And then you get back from France and then they go, oh, next weekend we're going to go to to Las Vegas. And then you come back. Oh, next weekend I'm going to buy you a car. And then next weekend uh, we're going to go to the casino and I'm going to give you $100,000 to play with it. And you're just basically like, does the guy love me or just does he just want someone that looks good on his arm? Right? What, what does this person want? Then you feel disingenuous. You feel like you're not loved. You feel like you're not appreciated. You feel like you're not understood. But if you're going, if you're going out with somebody that you have a connection with, right? We fall in love with somebody that mends our broken pieces. We fall in love with people that we end up knowing how to finish their sentences because you understand each other. Riley, it is it's clear here that Riley feels that you don't understand. I have a GoPro. I'll take a short video of our daily walk sent through later this week. Um, Riley doesn't know if you know what's going on. Riley doesn't know if you know what's the danger. Riley, Riley has no idea because you keep negotiating with her right and you used to be kind of a higher pitch tone of voice with her and you got to a point where you got a bit more of a lower register with her um yeah right here yeah just looking at the comments like deborah commented i worked with deborah uh angela auto yeah oh i didn't get that inquiry if you sent me an email I didn't get the email. Uh, okay, yeah, I didn't get the email, Tova. Um, you can send it through Messenger instead. But yeah, so so the, her low self-esteem and all that stuff. So how do you address that part of it? It's really, relatively, it's quite straightforward by just allowing her to understand that you're not 
not necessarily letting her get to the point where she's getting really upset, but the point of that you know that she's upset and that you can explain to her there's no reason to be upset. So you go, oh my gosh, how do you tell that to a dog? How do you explain it to a dog? Tone of voice, right? Again, dogs are primarily physical in communication and then they bark, 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 right? And that's how they also communicate. You can hear the, the strain, the tone in their voice and everything. You're welcome. Um, you can hear the tone and the strain in their voice. Right, you can hear the anxiety. You can hear that they have to go pee. Like it just seems like this whole actually this whole discussion is great theming on it. But right, so you can hear what's going on with them. So you want to start listening to her tone. You want to start listening to her starting to get a little grumbly that you may not hear when you're out for a walk because of all the road noise, whatever. You want to hear that, and then when you get home or before you leave, you have to also pay attention to the level of anxiety and behaviors that uh, Riley is exhibiting. Because Riley is showing that she's not really totally happy about going outside because she's like, I'm not safe. And I talk about resetting the dog. Uh, Otto knows that. Deborah knows that, right? Deborah's dogs that she's had for uh, nine plus years, Leo, couldn't, and he's a small little cute little dog, couldn't be around other dogs um, without just getting really upset. And, and he'd been attacked by three dogs in his nine years of life. And so he wasn't able to socialize and et cetera. And, and, and you know, Deborah said, uh, so worked with her just like one session. And then we did another session as well, but was able to, oh, she, she texts, uh, Deborah texts me, like, you text me, uh, Deborah, like two days ago. And I mean, we, we stay in touch, we're friends, but Deborah said that Leo for the first time. And, and so basically in t less than two months and only, uh, I think two sessions, right? Or three, no, two sessions. Yeah. Uh, in less than two months, uh, for the first time, Leo's out there playing with other dogs. Uh, she texted me that a couple of days ago. And that was just a beautiful, gorgeous text to see because just trusting the simplicity of the work. But yeah, um, so so just about resetting Riley, letting her know that you understand what the threat's going to be and making an adjustment of it. So you're going to have to make a bit of a, a reduction in your pace to about three quarters of your pace. You should watch the, uh, the psychology of buying the proper leash as well and also barking at noises outdoors as well uh, out, out the windows as well that that can help too because um you know right so it'll, it'll just give you an insight on on just making tonal adjustments and all that stuff but uh i'm gonna let everyone go kind of talk for for a while here um and um you know if you if you like what i talk about if you enjoy it you learned something on it please subscribe to my youtube channel please share my work to other facebook pages as well help spread what's going on all the stuff is done without treats or medication and you'll now understand as you see as things progress why it works uh, follow me on instagram and twitter at arf arf bark bark if you have any other questions, feel free to join my reactive dog group. Check out my website, rfrfbarkbark.com. You will see testimonials. You'll see newspaper clippings, front page articles, yada, yada. You will see testimonials from other owners. You'll see um, screenshots from other owners and everything like that. And you'll understand. Yeah, it is great for Deborah. Um, but you'll, you'll understand um, there's a much cooler way of working with dogs. And that is to really do what we always thought. Just connect to our dogs. Our dogs would defend us with their life. Without even thinking about it. How many people do we know that would do that? Other than police, fire, and ambulance, paramedics, military people. People who are sworn for a greater calling in life. Those are the people who would, right? And the Good Samaritans, and etc. But your dog, pretty well any dog that you bring into your life, will give their life to defend ours. So that's something to keep in mind, right? The scale of things. They're still predators, as I said earlier in the top of this. They're still predators, but they have that codependency on us. And I talk about the cohabitation of cross species, human and dog, human and canine, human and domesticated dog, the genus. It's emotional isomorphism. Two genetic traits sharing somewhat of a parallel similarities on, on you know key key things like that, which is the emotional codependency that goes on. Dogs are overt codependents. Humans are covert codependents. We need to be. We need to procreate. Same thing with dogs. They need to be. And they have no qualms showing it. So share that kind of love that you have with your dog. Share that with other people. Learn to experience and provide greater tolerance to other people. Even if it's an extra 10 or 20 seconds listening to somebody. Just let them talk. 
let them talk and then after that 20 seconds like okay that's cool we talked about it let's move on to something else please and uh, you know you want to be firm you want to be strong for sure because you want to get drawn into that emotional vampirism but at the same time it's just a little bit of tolerance will help and i talk about this every single time in all my vlogs just be kind to others we only have this one single life that we have and you can do absolutely amazing things with it thank you everyone have a good night bye bye